Welcome to a series of four videos on sizing simple span wide flange steel beams using multi-frame. You've basically been through this exercise already using tables. Now you're going to do it using multi-frame. Multi-frame does potentially enormously complex analyses for you possibly involving hundreds or thousands of structural members that may be connected together in very complex geometric ways. For example, a program like Multiframe would be absolutely essential to analyzing the structural frame in a building like the Guggenheim and Bill Bow. On the other hand, Multiframe is based on the same fundamental structural principles that we've been using, uh, for example, in sizing simple span steel beams from tables. There are certain types of structures that are so complex we can only do them with a computer program like Multiframe. And that's when we take a sort of leap of faith and we hope that we understand the program well enough and have enough confidence in it that we can believe in it. The way we come to have confidence is we actually use it in simplified situations where we can verify its results. I can tell you that I have used multi-frame in literally thousands of situations where I could verify its results against more fundamental analytic techniques and it has never failed computationally. Every once in a while, the program will exhibit strange graphic glitches where you can't get colors to render right or some problem of that sort. But the computational engine is rock solid and it's something you should have great confidence in. So right now we're talking about applying multi-frame to such a simple problem that it would be considered roughly akin to taking a Canon after a gnat. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it's important that you use multi-frame in these simple situations so you come to have confidence not only in what multi-frame is doing, but confidence in your ability to correctly input a description of your structure so that the output of the analysis will be something that you can rely on. There will be four sessions associated with this exercise. Session one, we're going to be using Excel as a preprocessor and a method of recording and formatting results. I've mentioned this multiple times before and I will continue to make a point of it. When you have a complicated problem that you're dealing with, you need to begin by writing down what you know and what you're trying to get at and put that down in some visually informative format. In other words, you're basically telling a story. This is where we're starting in terms of our knowledge. This is what we want to end up with. Here's how we're going about it. You can organize all that kind of information in a gridded format like uh, or a tabular format like Excel. And on top of that, you can use Excel to do some of your computations. Those computations will be clearly recorded, including what mathematical operations are being performed and what the input data is, so that you can go back and check your results. And finally, once you've created such an Excel spreadsheet, it becomes like a template where there are certain input variables that can be changed in order to apply that same computational technique to um, a geometrically somewhat different design situation. So we will be using Excel as a preprocessor to calculate loads and then we're also going to use it as a place of recording and formatting results. So we will take the loads information out of our Excel spreadsheet in session three and use that to load the structure in multi-frame. Before we do that though we'll have to do session two which involves setting up or describing the structural frame to multi-frame. <clears throat> that means we'll tell it where there are columns, how tall the columns are, what kind of primary beams there are, what kind of secondary beams, and so forth. 
Then we'll load the structure in session three. In session four, we'll perform the analysis and size the beams using multi-frame. Now, the analysis is actually all done in multi-frame. Multi-frame has within it all the mathematical machinery, so performing the analysis, once you've created the frame and loaded the frame, uh, the analysis is just a matter of pushing the button. Uh, sizing in multi-frame is a trial and error process, and that's a little slow. In fact, multi-frame for simple span steel beams will never be as fast as tables um, because it is a trial and error process. You'll put a beam in, and if you discover that the stress level is too high, uh, you'll have to put another beam in, and you keep going until you find the right one. So this, if all we ever did was simple span steel beams, we would have had no need for multi-frame. But the key thing I'll remind you of is that multi-frame is able to uh, handle astoundingly complex structures uh, and with great ease. And the beauty to, to uh, using multi-frame on a simple exercise like this is to allow us to check ourselves in terms of how we're using multi-frame and whether the results that are coming out of multi-frame are consistent with what we expect from our theories. Once we have performed the analysis and sized the beams in multi-frame, we will take that information and go back and record it in our Excel spreadsheet. So the Excel spreadsheet will be the final record of the sizing of all of the members. Now this is jumping ahead a little bit but um, the deliverables for this exercise will be the following. You will open a, multi, a Microsoft Word document. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, you'll be provided a spreadsheet to begin with. You've done this already uh, in a previous exercise, but you'll be provided a, a spreadsheet that formats things in a way that's convenient to this particular exercise and it will have included within it the loads calculations. Um, so you will be given that spreadsheet and you will adapt it to your uses. And then once you have created a, um, a multi-frame file and done all the analysis and done all the sizing, you will then have your spreadsheet in the multi-frame. And then you're gonna open a Microsoft Word document. And into that document, you're gonna insert an image of the spreadsheet, in other words, from Excel, showing the final sizing of the members and also showing all the loads calculations. In other words, you're going to put in an image of your entire spreadsheet as it looks after the entire um, process is complete. From multi-frame, you will extract a, a rendered frame image and insert that in Microsoft Word document. You will also create an image of the deflected form under live load and insert that into the Word document. And finally, you'll insert an image of the bending stress diagram under full factored load. And you want to do that with text that's large enough to read, which is adjustable in multi-frame. Don't create some little teeny image that's a small part of the field of view. Your, your responsibility is to make a legible image internal to the Word document. So if you capture an image and it's some tiny little thing that's not readable and you insert it into the Word, you might as well not bother doing that because if it's not legible and readable, then it won't count. After you've done all that, you're going to upload your Word file, your Excel file, and your final multi-frame file and you're going to label all of those or give those file names in the following manner. You're going to list your last name first, followed by your first name, followed by the assignment name. As in the following format, if I were handing this in, it would say place, lane, sizing steel beams in multi-frame, word doc, and then of course if you use extensions it would say dot DOCX after that. <clears throat> and then you'll have one with a similar name, except it will be an Excel file, and the extension will be .xls 
X. And finally, there will be a multi-frame dock which will have the extension .mfd. All this is going to be done on the Windows side. This software is available on the lab machines. All of the software, Word, Excel, and multi-frame. You can also download multi-frame and those of you who are interested in getting it onto your laptops, we will provide you the method to do that. It's a very powerful software which is given to students free, so some of you may choose to have it on your own machines. <clears throat> if we take a beam, like this piece of uh, foam rubber, uh, which by the way in a sort of neutral state is flat like this, and here it's sitting on a table, there are a couple of markings that represent two vertical lines, and then there's a red marking down the center of this beam. If we now lift it up under its own self-weight, and support it at the ends, it develops this rather dramatic curvature. If you take careful measurements on this beam, you discover there's no elongation of any of the material along this red line, but this material near the top has shortened quite a bit. The material on the bottom has stretched quite a bit, or elongated. The interesting thing is these two black lines, which were parallel to each other up here, remain straight lines, but now they're canted inward to reflect this deformation where we have shortening on the top and stretching on the bottom. The interesting thing is that because these lines are straight, it means that whatever deformation is occurring is in proportion of the dis to the distance that one moves away from the red line. So when you go here, there's a certain amount of shortening of the material relative to the neutral axis length. And if you go twice as far, there's twice as much shortening. In other words, we can say the fractional deformation of the material is shortening on the top in direct proportion to how far away from the neutral axis we move. And it's elongating on the bottom in direct proportion to how far away we move from the neutral axis. Now, we learned in materials that over the operating range of any of our common materials, the amount of deformation and the amount of stress that's causing that deformation, those two things are proportional to each other. So the fact that the deformation is proportional to distance from the neutral axis means the amount of stress is also proportional to the distance from the neutral axis. In other words, there's twice as much stress as there here as there is there. And likewise, there's twice as much tensile stress here as there is halfway towards the neutral axis. In other words, the stress pattern looks like this, where there's a state of neutral stress at the neutral axis, and the stress increases proportionally to the distance upward or the distance downward from the neutral axis. Now, all of this can be folded into a very complex and extremely beautiful mathematical theory that allow us, allows us to figure out the relationship between, for example, the length of the beam, the amount of load on the beam, the cross-sectional shape of the beam, and the material in the beam, we can figure out what this bending stress is. We can calculate it, and we can reshape the beam, or resize the beam, to keep that bending stress within some reasonable limit. Now, for steel, that bending stress is going to be, for these wide flanges, 50 KSI. Um, I'll tell you in advance, that we have a resistance factor for a steel beam, which is 0.9. In other words, we're saying we're not going to give it 100% credit because we lack confidence in whether it's straight or whether the cross-section is exactly right or whatever. Maybe the material properties aren't quite what we thought. Um, but we're going to give it a hit by multiplying it by 0.9. Now, another interesting thing that happens with steel beams is as they begin to yield, they actually get stronger. And in fact, 
steel beams, uh, wide flange beams, get anywhere from 11 to 13 percent stronger as they yield. So because of this strengthening phenomenon associated with this uh, yielding process, we actually will increase the strength of the steel beam by a factor of 1.11 up to conceivably 1.13. In other words, this strengthening essentially compensates or overcompensates for the hit the beam takes due to our resistance factor. So we multiply by 0.9, then we multiply by 1.11, and it becomes a complete wash. So in other words, in steel beams, when we're working in multi-frame, we can presume um, that 50 KSI steel can have 50 kips per square inch of stress on it under the full factored load. So anyway, there's a lot of mathematics going on. All that dirty mathematics is being done by multi-frame, and the part that we're playing in it is actually pretty simple, which is really nice because we can focus on getting a sense of the magnitudes of things and patterns in design as opposed to spending a lot of time doing mathematical arithmetic. Okay, so that will be our first sizing criterion, that under the full factored gravity load, the bending stress will not exceed 50 kips per square inch because that's the yield stress uh, for steel beams. Now, in addition to that, we have one more criterion that we have to address. And this foam beam is sort of indicative of the whole issue. We do get deflection in beams. And that deflection is really problematical when people are disturbed by the movement of the floor. Um, and typically, to deal with that, we have certain guidelines. It's also problematical if there's glass or some other brittle material that can be crushed when the structure moves. Now, we don't normally worry about this movement relative to total factored load or even relative to any kind of dead load or self-load because once the structure is built, all those loads remain permanent and don't change the shape of the building. What we worry about are things like live load, where people come to work and then leave and then come to work again, or they move around on the floor or whatever. So those, those loads cause the structure to change shape. So there's an example of a small school that was built, very elegant, award-winning school. It had concrete block partitions down the middle of the building and glass from the top of the concrete block up to the underside of the roof decking. Uh, they had a snow load, the roof deflected, and when they came in uh, the next day, there was glass all over the floors. So the issue of deflection in structures is an absolutely crucial part of it. We sometimes call this the serviceability issue because it involves things that may not involve the total collapse of the structure, but it may involve cracking or shattering or damage of parts, or just be an issue of perception. If we have glass involved, we really need to look very carefully at our deflection condition. We don't want to get into that much detail for the purposes of these studies, so what we're going to do is we're going to set a kind of standard deflection condition that we deal with always, no matter what, just based on people's perception of movement of the floor. And so that standard condition for what we're doing shows the following numbers. We're going to be dealing with a 30-foot span. And so I've written span in feet. Then I've converted that to inches. It turns out that's 360 inches. Now, for a very long time, we've had this, this criterion, which has been based on a lot of sort of common sense experience. 
that the deflection under full live load, so delta here is the amount of vertical movement at the center of the beam under full live load, should be equal to or less than the length of the beam divided by 360. Well, if our length is 360 inches and we plug that in here, we're saying a 30 foot long beam should not deflect more than about an inch. A uh, 40 foot long beam should not deflect more than 1.33 inches. A 60 foot beam shouldn't deflect more than two inches, but that's under live load. So one of the things you'll need to keep track of is your load condition, because when you're sizing for strength, you're going to be sizing under full factored load. When you're sizing for stiffness, you're going to only be sizing under live load. Okay, so our basic building will be laid out something like this. We have a 30 by 30 column grid. Um, we have some perimeter girders, some interior girders, and some joist. And by the way, the current, current terminology sometimes refers to these as primary beams and these as secondary beams. And these, we may not even have a name for those yet because these are certainly doing something special in the wall, but they're not picking up significant amounts or huge amounts of the floor loads like these. So we don't really have a name for these, but for what we're doing in this exercise, we're gonna treat these like those. Um, we're just gonna use these as tools to help us in the sizing process. So the total building might be two by two bays. It might be six by two bays, but we will understand the basic structure if we have analyzed this portion of it right here. We don't wanna pick this because when you think about it, then these become both perimeter girders. These are perimeter girders and we have nothing but joists along here. So if we really want a representative section of the building, we have to pick this one right here so that we have a perimeter girder, an interior girder, another perimeter girder, and a bunch of joists or a bunch of secondary beams. So when we're done, our structure will look something like this. We'll have an interior girder for the roof, an interior girder for the floor, perimeter girders for the roof, perimeter girders for the floor, and a bunch of secondary or joist members for both the roof and the floor. So when we get around to it, we're going to create this frame and multi-frame, but that will be session two. For right now, we want to go to the Excel spreadsheet. And it looks something like the following. So you'll remember our philosophy in dealing with this. Um, we're going to put some information across here. We're going to start with things that we know, like what are the spans? What's the spacing from the codes? We can get area distributed dead load, area distributed live load. Um, well, we get this from the codes. We get this from certain, we might get this from prescriptive codes or we might get it from certain knowledge of the decking that's involved. Um, and then here are some things we're going to figure out. We're going to figure out the line distributed load W for the dead and the line distributed live load um, in kips per feet. You'll notice here we're dealing with pounds per square foot because those are the customary numbers. But when we go into multi-frame, we need kips per foot. <clears throat> so we will automatically make that conversion before we go too far. And then over here, we have a portion of our spreadsheet, which is a place to record the results uh, from the sizing in the multi-frame analysis. And we have two columns. One is what's the result for stiffness? And the other is what's the result for strength? And those won't always be the same thing. For lightly loaded members, deflection or stiffness is going to tend to be what governs the design. For heavily loaded members, the beams are going to tend to get deeper. They're going to be uh, pretty stiff. 
and they're going to be governed generally by issues of strength. But we will see those patterns emerging as we go along. It kind of makes sense when you think about it. A really heavily loaded beam. Uh, you don't have to worry about web buckling because the web will inherently be fairly thick. So you can make the beam pretty deep. You're giving yourself a better lever arm. And typically deflection becomes a concern when the beam is too shallow. <clears throat> okay, so here we've listed roof joists, single loaded roof girder, double loaded roof girder, and similar things for the floor. Um, everything in blue in the spreadsheet, it works like a template. So anything that's blue, you can go in and change. In other words, you can recycle this template and use it for lots of different uh, spans and proportions. <clears throat> Excuse me, lots of different uh, grid spacings for the columns. Uh, in our case, we're going to do a 30 by 30 uh, column grid. So the roof joist length is 30 feet, the single loaded roof girder length is 30 feet, and the double loaded roof girder length is 30 feet, and the same is true for the floor. Now, in this problem, you're being told to use a spacing of 5 feet for the joist for both the roof and the floor. You can, of course, change that to anything you want to, but for this exercise, that's the way we're going to do it. Now, one of the interesting things here is the following. Uh, this joist spacing is some integral number subdivision of 30. So, in other words, we got six spaces to produce this five feet. In the case of the single loaded roof girder, this spacing depends strictly on the length of the joist. For example, if I go back to this diagram and I look at a perimeter girder, it supports halfway to the next girder, which happens to be the length of the joist. So in the spreadsheet here, um, this 15 actually has a formula. It's equal to B29 over 2. So if I go here, I say B29, uh, that's the length of the roof joist. So in other words, this has got a formula and it's put in in black because it's not really one of the things you should go messing with. Uh, it's based on that number right there. Likewise, if I click on this, it says B29 over one. In other words, it's just gonna be equal to the length of whatever that joist is. We have similar formulas down here. B39, which is this number right here, divided by 2, or B39. Okay, in Raleigh, North Carolina, for example, and in fact, in all of North Carolina, the uh, roof lab load is prescribed to be 20 pounds a square foot. Uh, this would be called roof snow in western North Carolina, and it would be bigger than 20 pounds a square foot because the snow load would be presumed to be the dominant load. In Raleigh, North Carolina, it's not. So on the roof, our P-Live is 20 pounds per square foot as prescribed in code. We have been taking, even for lightweight steel roofing systems, which might weigh less than 10 pounds a square foot, we've been taking them as 20 um, based on North Carolina state construction requirements. That's not a code requirement but it's a requirement on any state construction job that you have an extra 10 pounds a square foot of capacity for unforeseen future loads. Um, I have found in my experience that going by that guideline is a good idea. Uh, it costs almost nothing to add that extra 10 pounds a square foot of capacity to your roof, and it will astound you how much money it will save you down the road if you end up having to deal with that. For the floors, we're presuming 100 pounds per square foot of live load, and you're told 53 pounds a square foot for the floor decking, plus whatever loads are associated with the hung ceiling and the ductwork underneath. And for the moment, just take that number as a pretty good indicator of what we're gonna be dealing with in terms of floor decking loads for the rest of the semester. And the year. Okay, so we got some formulas here. 
W dead is equal to P dead times S. And then we have a conversion factor to get us from pounds to kips. And so if we look at this and we click on there, this says it's equal to uh, C29, which is the five foot width. So that's S times D29, which is the area distributed uh, P dead. And then we uh, have this division by a thousand, which represents that conversion factor. So we end up with 1.1 1. 1 pounds, 0. 0.1 kips per foot, kips per foot for W dead. We get the same number from w, for W live because these two numbers are equal. And then we go through and we do that for the single loaded roof girders. And not surprisingly, if that's 0. 0.1, this should be 0. 0.3 because that's five and that's 15. And likewise, if we go from five to 30 foot width, we're going to increase this by a factor of six. So these would be the dead and live load for um, the double loaded root girder. And we go through the same kind of numbers here. Uh, in this case, it's C39, which is that spacing times D39, which is the dead load of 53 pounds per square foot. And then we divide by a thousand, we get 0.625. And in this case, uh, we're going to throw in the same five, but we got a hundred pounds a square foot. So that's 500 divided by a thousand to make the conversion makes it 0.5 kips per foot. And likewise, we've got loads here for the single loaded, uh, floor girders and the double loaded floor girders. Um, you'll notice I've only highlighted in yellow uh, four numbers here. These numbers down here, here, and so forth. Those will be needed when we go to use tables to do sizing. And so we'll take this same kind of data into the tables to do that process. And we'll have to do some of the mathematics ourselves because we don't have multi-frame to do it we'll discover that we got some really pretty cool tables that we can just scan down pretty quickly. And in fact, uh, in a competition, a good engineer with a set of tables and an Excel spreadsheet can almost always beat multi-frame um, because multi-frame is inherently a trial and error program. And using it on simple span beams is kind of like, I don't know, taking a cannon after a gnat or something like that. Um, but uh, the beauty of multi-frame is it will do an astonishingly number, an astonishingly large number of very rich and interesting structures that you just couldn't possibly do out of tables. Okay, so here are the four numbers that we're going to take into multi-frame. We will use these to load multi-frame. And the reason we don't need these numbers right here is because multi-frame automatically translo transfers loads from the joist to the girders, or in other words, from the secondary beams to the primary beams. So all we have to do in multi-frame is load the joist, and then it will take care of all the rest of the analysis for us. That ends the first session on sizing simple span wide flange steel beams using multi-frame. Session one, dealing with using Excel as a preprocessor and a method for recording and formatting results.